Well, welcome everybody. It's great to be back, isn't it? I'm Paul Challenger, and I'm standing in to facilitate these live shows. No one can replace Ross, uh, so we're not even going to try. Our new format will be one of having a main feature, presentation of new videos made by members of the group or affiliated groups, and with a top and tail either side of it, with news, etc., and feedback on the live chat. Everyone is welcome to contribute a video, and in fact, we're asking for new work urgently. Angela or myself will act as liaison to publish them to the Britain's Hidden History YouTube site. Just message us by finding us on the Facebook group page, and you can find us under Members. So many of us will know about the GoFundMe campaign, but for those who don't know anything about it, or those who would like an update, here's Marshall telling me all about it. Hello, well today I'm talking with Marshall Abrahams about the Britain's Hidden History GoFundMe campaign. Hello, Mar Marshall. Hello, hello. <laughs> Here we are again. So can you tell us then today a little bit about the GoFundMe campaign? What are we raising money for? It was after, um, very, very soon after Ross died and the announcement went up um, uh, by Zavi on the BHH um, YouTube channel. And I was involved with the comments uh, in that. And um, uh, two or three people said, is there a GoFundMe campaign? Because we want to donate, we want to help. Funerals are very expensive. This is a very worrying time for Angie. Um, the last thing we want is for her to be worried about money as well as everything else. And I waited for a little bit and nobody else seemed to take the plunge. And I thought, right, I'm going to stick my neck out and, and start this going. Never done a GoFundMe campaign in my life. I'd barely heard of them. Um, but anyway, in we went and uh, started it, uh, started it going. There were one or two hiccups, um, um, but we, we got it going. Um, and um, it, 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 the, it flourished, um, astonishing generosity from people. Um, so that's, that's the beginning of it. Yeah, I remember seeing people asking. What, what else can I tell you? Yeah, I remember people asking on Facebook, what can we do? What, how can mm. we help? Because, you know, everybody was traumatised yes. by what happened. Well, it, I, oh, absolutely. And and it's no good saying money doesn't help. Uh, money oils everything, I'm afraid. Uh, so I really took off with a, with a bang. It was astonishing. There were two huge donations at the beginning. And again, and it's slightly lost momentum now, which is only to be expected. But... Um, uh, um, I can tell you about that if you like. Well, what what is the initial target then? Well, I started with five hundred pounds, oh. and we blasted through that in about three hours, which was wonderful. Um, so then I raised it to I think it was five thousand. I can't remember honestly now, but it began to climb and climb and climb. So again, I stuck my neck out and put a a, um, um, a, a goal of fifteen thousand. I don't know why I chose 15,000. It just seemed a nice round sum. It's a useful figure. It, it, it really helps 15,000. So it's still open and it's still there for people to donate to. Excellent. How much do you think is in the fund now? I thought I saw maybe 11,000 odd. It's 11,381, I think. Wow. So it's kindness and generosity of that sort, which I, I think... Um, it was a real surprise to Angie. Uh, Much love is up there, yeah. It sank, it sank in yeah. that this was going on in the background. She was as staggered as I've been and everybody's been by the sheer generosity of the BHH people. Simply, wow. simply amazing. So, and you've done a marvellous job starting it and, you know, every credit because it is a beautiful gesture. Oh, well, I'm, thank you so much. Uh, um, I would never have thought of it had it not been for people asking. And I seem to be the um, the one person uh, who was uh, able to, uh, um, you know, grasp 
the nettle and actually get the thing going. And also I'd had that wonderful experience of being close to Ross's family for all those months and um, making firm personal friends with them. So I sort of felt I could stick my neck out and I'm so glad I did. Yeah. There was a couple of little um, comments in the picture of Marshall that Ross drew. And the comment was that you can find the GoFundMe page by uh, just Googling, put it in your search engine, GoFundMe, either Marshall Abrahams or Britain's Hidden History. And that's what the pic, there was wording on the pictures. Thank you, Marshall. Now I'm a member of a camera club and uh, we had a visit from a very charming lady employed by Rhonda Cunnantaf County Council and they've been approached by the National Lottery who offered to fund a project. Well, let's be fair, the council are not going to turn down money for anything, are they? The project is called Altered Images. Let me just read from the flyer. So the Altered Images project is a three-year project managed by RCT's Library Service, funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. The project aims to look at how views of the past change over time and how understanding the past can challenge our assumptions about where we come from and how our communities developed. It will do this by looking at two areas, memorials and statues, and stories, myths and legends, which they'll be sending people around to interview locals. It, pretty much in the same way that um, Alexander Cordell did when he searched out the background information for his series of books. Went round the valleys on his motorbike, stopping and recording people's history. Their oral history. So there's a picture of the boundaries of Rhonda the Cannon Taff. It's a landlocked picture, not reaching the coast. And on one side of it, very interestingly, is Lamharan and Brinner, where most of us will know that St. Peter's Super Monton is located and Llanelid Cor. So they're actually in Rhonda Cannon Taff. Now, on the County Council's website, you can find a map section. And in the map section, a whole list of monuments that have been scheduled in the County Council area. And it, it runs to several pages long. It's just a couple of the pages. If you look at that particular one I've put up, look how many round canes have, have been attributed to the near, near the vicinity of the village of Hirwine. Now, I remember Keith Price and his video about the Baton, Battle of Baden. And he said it was a campaign and he followed the trail of the battle from Baden up the one valley to where the, the hill fort had been destroyed and over the top past Hirwine, down the valleys to Pontypridd and then up to Rusison from Pontypridd. And if you look at that page there, the amount of round cairns near Hirwine, it might suggest that those are the very grave mounds of the people killed in the uh, campaign. Only a guess. So this is yet another picture, a page from the uh, series. And you can see there's a photograph there of Llanelid. I'm going to say this, but obviously I don't believe it. Llanelid Castle Mound. That's the prevailing knowledge, isn't it? Anything that's a tump gets named Norman. And there's also St. Peter's Church and the remains of. So uh, what the council are planning to do is to have people take concurrent photographs of 
these monuments, memorials, and to compare them with any existing photograph to see what changes there may be. And take a look at that page there now. There's a great many monuments in the top right hand segment of Ronda Cunnan Taff. I thought that was interesting. Now, Ronda Cunnan Taff is just one council. Maybe every council, especially those in South Wales, have map sections on their websites. So that might be a very useful resource. The project is quite official. I'll just hold up some of the documentation that comes with the project. And there's a lot of paperwork to fill in. So we have a choice. Anybody who wants to take photographs of um, cairns and mounds and such like, as a lot of our people do. Uh, anybody who wants to take photographs and submit them to Ronda Cannon Taft Council can either do so as an individual and get your own forms and I can give you the ladies contact details or we could put them in as a group effort and I'll collate them and send them in they just uh, they're all digitalized so it's on, all on email the, the one essential thing is whether you do it individually or we do it as a group is that we do not relinquish copyright I think that's the sheet about copyright uh, Ronda and Kenneth Taff obviously want to put the photographs on their system in their digital archive for, as part of this project, which would be open then to anyone through the library system to access these photographs. And they may, may also want to use the photographs for other reasons. Well, obviously we do too. So we are not going to relinquish copyright to the council. And there is a box that you can tick on the forms so whether we do it as a group or individuals, make sure you don't relinquish copyright. So there's going to be more news and updates before each live show, assuming I can get them right, or whoever takes over. Uh, there may not be a regular supply of new material, but that's not a problem as the reruns of Ross's work are very popular and will still feature as the main event on some Sundays. And this brings us to tonight's main feature, and it is a Zoom interview between the highly knowledgeable Marshall Abrahams and myself, not so highly knowledgeable. And we're talking about Marshall's literary works, mainly about her new book to be published soon, about the migrations of Brutus and Albine, but also about her series of novels. Marshall is with us for the live chat this evening, And here's the video. Well, today it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest today, Marshall Abrahams. Welcome, Marshall. Thank you. And thank you for giving us your time. Now, you're one of the early supporters of the Britain's Hidden History Movement. Yes. We actually met at Ross's funeral. I remember. And that was a beautiful tribute you gave. And on it was on such an emotional occasion. It was. Um, I was enormously honoured uh, to be asked by Angie to do that. Um, I have to say that my contribution to the tribute itself was pretty minimal because it was um, Ross's, uh, Ross's cousin, um, Neil Broadstock, who actually provided the the meat of it, so to speak, and it was my pleasure to read his wonderful words. Like all Welshmen, he seems to be a natural poet, so that was how that came about. But yes, it was an enormous honour to be asked to, to to give it, and wasn't it a packed day, despite the dreadful weather? I was in the other uh, church. It was two of them were packed. Mm. Uh, well done for that. You did marvellous there. Thank you. So, so did the we... other two, by the way. So yeah, the other two, it was a, um, yeah, it was very special, very special to be there. 
It was indeed. So before we start then, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, I could. I'm not quite sure what there is uh, very interesting to say. Um, I'm, I've always been fascinated by words. English language has always been my, my thing. I used to be laughed at at school because I read dictionaries for fun. <laughs> and um, it's, um, I'm, I'm a soldier's daughter and a soldier's widow, so I have a natural uh, affinity with um, the army mind, if you like. My mother was in the Wrens during the war. And um, I'm not particularly, uh, I didn't go to university or anything like that, which I minded a lot because my father came from one of those uh, formidably intelligent Scots families. Um, and it was just as well I didn't go to university because I would not have made the grade at all. Um, but I, I, I'm lucky actually that I didn't go because I seem to have turned the other way around. And instead of um, climbing up the greasy pole with the rest of the academics, I'm now a deep sea diver. And uh, this is a, a very much less, um, a less occupied field, academically speaking. And uh, so, yes, I, 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 do I have to say anything else? No, that's great. <laughs> I, I find you very interesting. Oh, thank you. Half Scots, half English, lots of Welsh and an Irish grandmother. So um, I think that qualifies me as British. And, and with maybe an Israeli of two tribes of Judah surname. Oh, no. Uh, no, it's a it's a farming family from Shropshire. Uh, it might have been Hebrew in origin. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There's a tremendous connection between the name Abraham and Britain, as I've discovered during wow. my research for the Great Migration. So what brought you into Britain's hidden history then? Um, I like a lot of people. It was finding um, the, the wonderful book, uh, The Holy Kingdom by Wilson and Blackett and Adrian Gilbert. And it was a complete revelation to me. And I read that book, I've got it here. Shall I show you um, the, the state it's in? This, this copy of mine, it's got ears, it's 30 years old, it's full of my um, uh, scribblings and it's got bits stuck at the beginning. This was my early Bible, the Holy Kingdom. I know we're not supposed to be um, uh, talking about that, but um, through that, I found uh, Alan Wilson and Baron Blackett's uh, other books. And uh, we're going back, we must be going back the best part of 20 years now, 15, 18 years, somewhere around there. And um, there was a telephone number at the back of one of his books, uh, Wilson and Blackett's books. Was it The Trojan War? I can't remember. And um, uh, I, I rang it and Alan Wilson answered. I didn't realise wow. it was his home number. And we spoke for about 45 minutes and I've never forgotten it. And then, um, like a lot of people, I was trying to, um, I think I only bought two of their books and I was missing one. And some years later, I tried to find it and it was, they were going for ridiculous prices on Amazon, thousand pounds, 1500 pounds, far out of my league. So I gave that up, uh, that idea up. And then I tried to find um, them again some years later. So we're going back about four years now, four or five years. And imagine my surprise when I saw they were all re republished by Cumroglyphics. And I thought, well, I don't know, that's a new name on me. Um, <clears throat> so I ordered a couple and they came with the most wonderful handwritten letter from Ross. Wow. And uh, I'd explained in my letter that I was um, interested in this, that, oh, no, in my letter of answer to him, I mean, that I was also very interested in Britain's hidden history. And, um, I think this was even before he'd started his YouTube channel. And I was already collating notes about Brutus and, and the migrations based largely on what I'd found in here. And um, he said, well, you must come to Wales one day. So uh, we fetched up in Tonteg and uh, that was 2020, October of 2020, just in time for the lockdown. And so our, our six week stay lasted for eight months. And I began this wonderful um, uh, 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 collaboration with Ross, which, en which ended up with me um, editing the Odyssey book for, of, of, of Wilson and Blackett's and doing all his proofreading and that sort of thing. 
and really, really getting on with Brutus and, and then Albine, because it was Ross who said, well, why don't you write the book? So that's that's how the Great Migrations came about. Wow. So this is going to be a massive addition to the bringing of true British history to light then, your, your I book? I sincerely hope so, yes. So what's yes. the title of it? The Great Migrations to Britain. And when did of, you write that then? Um, well, I, I started collating the notes for Brutus, as I say, about... 10 or more years ago, but it was really Ross who nudged me on to putting it into a book with the other Great Migration, the previous one, the Albine one from Suma. And um, so I did, and it's in two parts, and I've done it in the true British fashion. We sink back in time. So Brutus comes first, Albine comes second. And I thought, well, you know, if I get 40,000 words out of this, that'll be surprising. And it's now 101,000 words, and that's wow. absolutely yeah. stunning because I had no idea there was so much to find. I thought I would be, um, you know, padding it with, with speculation and whatnot. And indeed, there is speculation, but it's based on... Uh, it's based on a pretty fa fair and firm foundation. Excellent. Uh, I didn't... I cut you off then before you said the full title, so it's the great... Migrations, the great migrations to Britain. To Britain of 1567 BC. And here we stop because I'm not sure uh, how long it took Brutus um, to leave uh, Italy, go to Epirus, gather all his Trojan refugees, build a fleet, gather some more Trojan refugees, send all his um, messengers around the Aegean and bring them home to Britain. I've allowed him, um, he was a co-consul with Collatinus for a year between 509 and 508 BC. And I've allowed him, and I, I really don't know whether this is a, a, a sensible length of time, but I've allowed him two years to do all that that I mentioned in Epirus and, and around the Aegean and so forth. Um, so I bring him home to Britain in 506 BC. So it's 1567 BC and 506 right. BC. But that, that is pure speculation. <laughs> right. So do you think your book then will be the first ever serious study specifically of Brutus and Albine? Um, of Albine, certainly. Uh, there has been one book about Brutus, which was a serious study. Um, and I do have a copy of it. Now, if I, I, I'm not going to mention the name. Now, that's not because um, I either fear the competition or you know, I don't wish to, uh, I, I'm not being, um, God, what's the word, uh, uh, precious about this. But when I read it, I was so disappointed for the writer because what he'd done was to try and get at Brutus from the literary uh, evidence, if you can call it that. And you could tell throughout that this man was longing for Brutus to have been a real person, but the sources he chose to base his work on were literary, and therefore he came to the reluctant conclusion that Brutus was a figment. And that is really sad uh, because you could tell you could tell he'd put in an awful lot of work. It's a very good book, but unfortunately it's not based in history. And that makes me sound as mean as anything, um, which is why I'm not going to give the name or, or the author, because that simply wouldn't be fair. But that's a bit apart like, from that... Um, yeah, I was going to say, that's a bit like the Arthurian legendary writers, you know, the ones who, yes. who talk about yes. Arthur only from the literary yes. um, works. In that's the... a very good analogy, that, yeah. yes. Um, but apart from that book, uh, mine is the only serious study of Brutus based in as much history as I can possibly dig up. And boy, have I managed to dig up a lot. <laughs> so where, where did you dig it up from then? What's the base data? Now, when you sent me the script uh, of, of questions for this, I looked at that question and I thought, blimey, how on earth do I answer that? Where did I get it from? Um, if I say one thing led to another, <laughs> That's going to sound like the rankest sort of cop out, um, but it's true. It's it, it's been a detective story. Um, for example, I like um, uh, going to primary sources wherever I can. I'm not really uh, uh, content with what somebody else says about something. I like to go and consult the primary sources wherever possible. 
And if you do that, uh, you find not only doors, windows opening up. So you have to go and examine um, that particular uh, a vista and you make notes and you come back and you think, but here, hold on a moment. This has actually thrown up far more questions than it answers. Um, what about that? That doesn't seem to be um, uh, particularly uh, logical. Let's go and examine it. And then you find that uh, actually your own theory was right and it fits into place chronologically. Um, I, I don't think I can answer the question any better than that. Point to the actual basic it's, data. It's, it's yeah. a detective. It, um, oh. I've, I've become a, a, um, an historical detective, actually. Well, actually, you've coined a, a, a phrase for what you do, haven't you? Because yes. based on your passion <laughs> and love of words that you were talking yes, about yes. from childhood, you describe yourself as an archaeographer. An archaeographer, yes. And so um, that study then becomes archaeography. That's right, yes. So you've coined them that's terms. What, what do you intend them to convey? Well, um, um, archaeography is a form of um, linguistical archaeology. And uh, it, it's basically consulting etymologists um, who only ever seem to go down to the, they take a word and they go down to the ground level. So can I give an example? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. The thing I'm talking about. Yeah, if you, that'd be fine. Is that all right? Yeah, that'd be great. If you take the yeah. words um, inch, as in a 12th part of a foot, and ounce, they don't, apart from having an N um, and a C, and they don't look as though they've got anything in common at all. Actually, if you, if you take them both back to their source, they come from a Proto-Indo-European word, uh, um, meaning one or unique, and I'm still on the trail of this one because I've just discovered uh, um, that inch in Welsh is modveth, and mod on its word is an old word for a circle, and here we have one unique, you see, and you think, but, yeah. gracious, but there are 12 inches, how does that fit in with 16 ounces in the pound, and you think, my goodness, I'm never going to get to the bottom of this. Um, and then I discovered, of course, and this is a long time ago, that there are 12 troy ounces. And there's, this is also hugely significant, so significant that it was my first video on YouTube. Um, 12 troy ounces to a troy pound. And that was the uh, measurement that we had in this country uh, long pre-medieval. Don't listen to anybody who says it, it was medieval um merchants it was nothing of the kind we had the tri pound in this country until the normans came and the normans of course have 16 had 16 ounces to the pound which is what we use now if we're allowed to by the eu and um but they actually mean exactly the same thing based on what i've discovered today about this modvev anybody who speaks welsh will know uh, know the word um mod is, uh, uh, if it's a circle, when you've got 12 circles making something really rather um, amazing as a concept. And as I say, I haven't got that one to, to its full uh, um, um, conclusion yet. But wow. uh, this is how I follow um, lines of research. And it sounds dreadfully airy-fairy, but um, it isn't. It's all I can say. But the migrations occurred a very long time ago, maybe 3,400 and 2,500 years ago. Can you, can you show how archaeography helped in the study of Brutus and Albine? That's a big question. It was less, uh, it was less, um, I won't say less helpful, I used archaeography less uh, to find Brutus because he's slightly closer to us in time and there are histor historical records. For Albine, um, buried much more deeply, it was really a question of teasing apart um, the, the teasing uh, lumps of fact out of the British habit of uh, hiding factual things under a cloak of uh, a myth. 
and they do this very, very well. Um, we mentioned Abraham uh, a, a little while ago. Now, it seems very sensible to me that there cannot, we were talking about the Albine migration, Abraham's, biblical Abraham's migration, and Hugh Gadam, uh, who also turns up in the Colbrin. Now, all from the same area, three massive migrations, it's simply not credible that an entire country would do this three times over within the space of whatever it is. There are three uh, names, three identities for one migration. This was my conclusion. And um, I don't pretend to have all the answers to this, certainly not in, in, in this context, but uh, um, I don't even have all the answers in the book, but I do make, a, I hope, a very good stab at it. Now, um, the Quran specifically locates Abraham at Ur, uh, which I'm sure isn't how you pronounce it. Um, Abraham, as I've said before, the name Abraham turns up all over this country. And um, Hugh Gadon, uh, Hugh Gadon's migration, um, which um, has also been, um, is also connected, but specifically Abraham, because I think I better stick to safe waters, literally. Um, in the Brute, uh, where is it? Um, the Brute or Chronicle. I've got it out somewhere. Um, the Brutal Chronicle of England, um, there is a bit that uh, talks about the migration and how they um, named the seven. And it, it's, um, the seven is the same, as we know in Welsh, is Irhabren, um, I think, in, in Welsh, the seven. Um, but in one of these records, it's actually called the River Abraham. Now, as you can imagine, yeah. I, I nearly fell out of my seat uh, when I discovered that. So that was what got me looking at the name of Abraham. What does this name mean? Now, it's supposed to be mean father of nations. Well, that might have been what he was, but it isn't what the name actually means. And this is where archaeography comes into it, because... There's a notion, um, and you'll have to forgive me, it sounds as though I don't know my own material, but my head is spinning with indexes, sorry, indices, and a list of illustrations, are they on the right side of the page? So I'm not thinking at that very deep level at the moment, so I can't, off the top of my head, remember um, all the exact definitions, but there's a relationship between um, Abraham and feathers, um, which is also related to the Psalms. Um, thou sh how, uh, he shall uh, he shall hide thee under his feathers. Psalm ninety one. That's a, 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 a not an exact uh, um, quotation. You'll have to forgive me. Um, and also a relationship with um, covenant. And covenant in Hebrew is berit or brit. Mm. And this word covenant, the notion, this is how archaeography really uh, um, comes into its own, because this notion of covenant, meeting, pledge, vow, promise, turns up over and over and over again in these stories. And if I find something like that, uh, um, that, that I know I'm on the right track, it sounds terribly woolly, I know, but in the book I show, as it, well, do you remember at school, now you've got to show your working, show your workings out. <laughs> and I do try to show uh, as clearly and simply as, pos as I possibly can, how I uh, take something and arrive at a conclusion for it. And this notion that the seven Ehabron was called Abraham, and it's in one of these records that of course I can't find, um, was to me an absolute blow away because uh, uh, it, it, it took a completely anomalous lump of Brutus' story out of the wrong place and enabled me to disentangle it for the myth that it was and put it back in its proper place a thousand years before. Wow. So and that's we... basically what I've been doing. Oh. There's no wonder my head's spinning. Yeah, we flew down from um, Belfast, internal flight. Yes. Yeah, and I was amazed when I looked down, I saw this straight super highway, uh -huh. silver, uh -huh. in the middle of Britain. Yes. 
Wales and the borders in the borders yes. there, isn't it? it? It seemed to be a straight line, and it was yes. it looked like a super highway. Yeah, that was the River Severn from above. Wow. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned schools. Yeah. Then these migrations just aren't taught in schools, are they? No. Is that because uh, is that because academia doesn't embrace them as fact? Well, I'm going to be very naughty here, and I'm going to answer that with a question. Why is the um, ancient and immaculate uh, um, civilization of Sumer not taught about in schools? Um, yeah. We, I think this is not the time or place to go into what lies behind all the uh, undoubted uh, um, manipulation um, and uh, um, um, of our education system. Uh, in, in living memory, for example, S Scott's state education was the best in the world, no question, not any longer. Now, something, some vested interests, some, I think we all know what and who we're talking about, um, has made it so that the education system does not teach people how to think for themselves as thank god i was taught uh, taught how to think for myself they're taught what to think and that is the beginnings of tyranny and i think there i'd better stop otherwise we i haven't got enough money to bail either of us out of prison <laughs> which is undoubtedly where we'll fetch up if i carry on like that so wh why is it then that mainstream academia hasn't long found uh, what you because found? mainstream academia is is not um, interested it, uh, I oof, I think it's more than their life's worth. They, right. if, uh, the, the vested interests we're talking about hold their jobs and their reputations over their heads. Um, we've seen the damage that can be done to an independent thinking uh, um, uh, scientist, Emmanuel Velikovsky, the damage done to Wilson and Blackett. Um, oh gosh, there must be several others. There's a Canadian woman uh, gosh, I can't even remember her discipline. That's terrible. I'm so sorry. Um, she had a double barreled name and she found something that didn't fit the mainstream narrative. And her reputation was pulverized and she's never oh. been heard of again. And I'm afraid it happens more and more and more. Um, to actual academics in the university world, is it? Well, Wilson and Blackett well, weren't in the university world, were they? They were not, no, but they trod on some very vested interests. Yeah. I'm Have you afraid. had any support at all from academia or any positive commentary when you've reached? Have you ever reached out, for example? Well, what do you enough, think of this? Um, I do. I do have a, a, a website, which is I haven't got anything on it really, except my mugshot that Ross drew, um, and a potted biography uh, on academia, um, which is seems to be uh, a very free th it, it, it seems to be a, a, a magnet for free thinking academics now this is an amazing thing yeah. and i have found um several papers uh by oof, gosh let me pull a name out of the ethers uh yuri mazenkis for one who um writes about the Hittites and uh, gosh I hope I've I hope I've tacked him onto the right discipline just my luck if he's if he's something to do with Anatolia which of course is the Hittites oh dear um uh, uh yes I, I found several papers on on academia which have been a tremendous help in in um, either supporting my theory or shoving it in the right direction um I haven't put anything up on academia myself uh, simply because I can't spare the time at the moment and I don't quite know what to put up but um, I haven't had either support or <laughs> um, the, the reverse uh, uh, oppression from academia but then I'm not I'm still under the radar at the moment yeah academically but, speaking well let's hope that we'll doesn't change negatively yeah let's hope it doesn't change I negatively when you do publish so your work takes the historical perspective regarding the migrations back to the time and area of Asia Minor. Uh -huh. I think that's right. Prior to migration, before the yes. migration. So that, that, in other words, is a prequel then to the migrations. Is it dealt with in your book or, or do you have another book planned? 
it's um, it's mentioned where it's necessary to provide a foundation for what I'm talking about in the book, The Great Migrations. Um, I don't expand on it in The Great Migrations for the simple reason that The Great Migrations would be, a, you know, about that big uh, by the time I finished. So, yes, I do have a prequel planned. Um, and we have to remember at this distance in time, people were much more connected to what you now know I call the numinous, um, which is not just God, it's that sense of purpose, the a sense of direction, the, the, the blueprint that lies behind us all, some in, in some stronger than in others. Um, that I call the numinous. It's, um, people were far more connected to it three, four, five thousand years ago. Um, and how this came about, how man and the spirit world, spiritual world, and the world of the urges um, behind us, I don't mean bodily urges necessarily although uh, they are important but and they also have their counterpart behind the scenes i hope i'm making sense um that underpins humanity to a far far greater degree than it does now and i examine all this um, in, in actually two, two forthcoming books, one of which is half written, um, the prequel to The Great Migrations, which was to, to try and answer your question with some degree of appositeness, uh, is called Finding the Phoenix. And then the other one, which is a slightly more, uh, um, not religious, re religion, my goodness, has a bad name, but God as man, man as God sort of thing. That's, I, it has a working title of, uh, of God's body, at the moment oh, so yes two more two more books like that uh, to come which will explain the background behind us as humans i hope oh, nice. either that or i yeah. shall have gone raving mad and i'll be in a bin somewhere <laughs> i'm not quite sure well best of luck with those i mean if you put the name god the word god in the book title apparently you sell more books i think oh, there's people who oh, just buy it because the word god is in it Oh, good. God. They get a shock by the sound of it. They might have a bit of a shock. Well, so, um, yes, I hope not. So this book now, the next, the first one, The Great Migrations, that's due yes. out before Easter? This before year? Easter, yes. Angie's given me a deadline of the end of February, which I'm trying my damnedest to stick to. Oh, sorry, I swore. Uh, my best to, to stick to. Um, uh I haven't got a huge amount left to do, but this index is going to take the bulk of the time. So, yes, let us say, if, if Angie watches this, please forgive me. But yes, let's hope it'll be out before Easter. Easter this year? Yes. Oh, yeah, oh, gosh, yes. Yes, I want, to see the away, then. I want to see the back of Brutus and Alba, and I want to move on to uh, what lies behind them. Uh, we haven't really had a potted history of um, Brutus or Alba. Is there a quick pot in history? Oh, yes, indeed. Um, Brutus uh, turns up in the Welsh genealogies in his exact right place. Um, the English Brute and uh, um, ancient historians such as Camden Hollinshead, uh, Robert Fabian, F Percy Enderby, um, they take him out of context and stick him back in Albine's time. Um, as I've sort of vaguely explained, uh, uh, it was quite easy to actually take him out of that, put him back in his proper context, and the whole thing now moves seamlessly from Noah forwards. Um, Brutus, uh, therefore, uh, Brutus descends um, at the very least from King Lear. Uh, this is all in the Welsh genealogies. And he comes from um, the, the, the three daughters, everybody knows uh, of Shakespeare's play, Goneril, Regan and Cordelia. Cordelia had no children. Um, Goneril's son and um, Regan's son both fought for the throne. Um, Goneril's son won, uh, as he should, because he was the elder. Lear descends from, uh, so sorry, Brutus descends from Lear's second daughter, Regan. And I've matched up the generations and everything. Wow. And um, he is of Etruscan origin um, at a time when there was very little difference between the Etruscans and the British, because we're talking mm, 
150 years only after the Anatolian um, migration to Italy. Yes. Um, and uh, he was, and he's actually described by Nennius as uh, Brutus was a consul. So that was a, a, a tremendously important clue to hang, um, uh, to hang Brutus on. Also, uh, he, uh, Enderby, Percy Enderby, who wrote Cambria Triumphans, um, this wonderful book, which Ross holds up or used to hold up all the time, Cambria Triumphans. Can you see that okay? Yeah, I can see it, yeah. Um, he actually calls Brutus, Brutus Priscus, thereby hanging Brutus to his Etruscan origins. Um, Lucius Tarquinius Priscus was his grandfather. Wow. That's, it, it's, it hangs together beautifully. Uh, it doesn't sound like much when I, I say it like this, because I'm just plucking names out of the air, but it all hangs together. Um, uh, yes, so it, uh, he, um, there was civil war going on in Britain at the time. And uh, to cut a, a, a quite a long story short, a 50,000 word story short, Brutus uh, was asked to come back to this country to, as a lineal descendant of Lear, uh, to, um, to take the throne and quell the civil war because rumors of his warlike tendencies and his magnificence as a leader, he's actually called Bruce the warlike in one of the, uh, one of the genealogies. Um, the genealogy of Yestin Gorgon, I think it is. And so he's asked to come to this country to take the throne and, and shut up the claimants and quell the civil war. And that's what he does. Um, so that's him. Um, I better not go into too much detail, had I? Or... There's no, no, there's no need. Just wetting right. the appetite for your book, basically. Well, the Albine thing, um, I've managed to... Uh, to, to connect very satisfactorily, far more satisfactorily than I had a hope to do, to um, a princess of uh, Sumeria called Taram Dungi. And she married um, the king of a neighboring province called Bashime. And um, again, I, I won't give away too much because it's all in the book, right. but uh, she came here, there were, um, I, I tried to find out the reason why um, this massive migration from Suma happened. And uh, Morgan um, in the British, here we are, yet another of Guyan Books' offerings. This has been absolutely superb. And uh, he says it's because of floods. And that all ties up very nicely with Santorini and the explosion, the massive explosion with a, a, a tidal wave, a tsunami, which would have gone around the entire world. And as you probably know, Ur uh, was um, uh, very low lying at the mouth of the conjoined Euphrates and Tigris Delta. They're like the Marsh Arabs. It's, it's pretty much what the Marsh Arabs would, would know today if there are any left of them. Um, so very, very easily flooded. Uh, and that seems to be the reason why they left. The whole thing's completely swamped and they had troubles with the neighbours, the Gutians. And uh, there are other reasons they needed tin as well. And guess which was the greatest tin producing place in the ancient world? We are, were. So well, that's tin as well. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah. It, it's, the, it's more complex than that. But really, the great migrations, I do not pretend that it answers all the questions. What I hoped I've done is um, lay a firm foundation for other people to go and pick bits that they like and go and do the really detailed and thorough research and examination, because that's not something I'm good at. I can't specialise in that way. I, I'm not an expert at, 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 at you know, um, gosh, anything really, except possibly archaeography. Um, yeah. So what I'm hoping is that people will take the great migrations and say, right, well, this will, this is my field. This needs examination. I can go and do this and come back and, you yeah. know, it, yeah. all, it all provides... Well, I think what you're even just talking about it, you're putting migrations of the modern world into perspective. So you've said why these people leave. I mean, you could imagine all the Bangladesh 
population up in and leaving Bangladesh is so low lying. It would be the same thing, wouldn't it? Yes. And, and it the boat was. people coming over from from Dover, you know, um, they're yes. leaving because of war. They're leaving their homelands because of drought. And um, uh, yes, yeah. and uh, uh, there are political reasons behind that as yes. well. Which we, so uh, it's what people do. If it's circumstances it where you are do. aren't right yes. and you can't yes. change them, then you change your viewpoint where you are, don't you? You know, you up and you go. You do indeed. So and we're there all... seems to be... So I was just going to say, we're all mongrels then on this island. Uh, um, we're not... not, we're not well, we are and we aren't, actually. Um, so what does the DNA show then? Is that where you're going to... How are you going to answer this? Um, I... Oh, gosh. The, the DNA, the DNA for the match between the Anatolian um, people and um, the Etruscans is pretty good. Uh, there are plenty of um, papers which I do not pretend to understand, but I can vaguely work out um, that there is a match between the people who left Anatolia the Hebrews who left Anatolia and fetched up in, in Etruscan Italy. And there's not only a match between them, there's a match between the cattle that came with them, wow. which is... It's even wonderful. better evidence, isn't it? Yeah. It, indeed it is. I would love to be clever enough at DNA uh, to find a match between um, the people who came with Brutus and fetched up in Britain. Um, 150 years later, yeah. after the uh, Anatolian yeah. migration. I'm yeah. not. Um, no. This is one of the areas where I'd absolutely love. Um, a microbiologist, no, that's yeah. Germany, isn't it? Um, yeah. Somebody, by, somebody <laughs> anyway, who's, who's qualified yeah. in this field, to go and have a look at this DNA and see, um, see exactly how it all fits in. So the answer to that is a qualified, yes, DNA does come into the Great Migrations, but only where I've been able to understand the paper and right. um, where I can apply it. I'm not nearly clever enough to go and, uh, um, uh, um, you know, go off into a separate uh, field of, of study. I, DNA is not my thing, but yeah. not. Yeah, uh, an, American friend, an American friend of mine thought all the Welsh and Scots were all uh, white, very pale skinned and red headed. So I corrected her. Actually, the archetypal Welsh, which is British, is black haired, short and um, olive skin, darker skin. It's true. And that seems to be a Cymric Anatolian thing. Yeah. However, um, there's a lot of reference to the tall, red headed, tartan wearing um, people whose bodies fetch up inconveniently all over the place, such as Urumqi and uh egypt uh mum is all over six red hair that's true red yeah. hair exactly yeah. so it seems to be um two distinct um but interlocking um body types uh right. and this seems to match with the um the twin pillar concept again i go into that the twin pillar concept because it's not just a, a thing of freemasons it's the, the strength and the establishment if you like it's the strength of the body uh, with the establishment of the mind so you can't just have no. um without the mind the strength just becomes brute force uh, it needs the refinement it needs the, the mind it, equally mind without body has no power over anything um so the two go together um so that think that of, ties in with your numinous that you were talking about. Uh, yeah, there. yes, absolutely, which is all in, in all informed and influenced by by what lies behind. It's so did, did, so did these uh, did these tall, red headed people then uh, inhabit these islands before the Great Migrations? Oh, I or would who, say who, they who did. did. <laughs> you think um, they did? did you? Well, right. the, if if you if you take Morgan's word for it, yeah. And why shouldn't I? Yeah. Um, you know, innocent until proven guilty, right until proved wrong. That's how we do things in this country or used to. Um, he says that Noah, whose name was not Noah, um, left these islands and went out to um, the uh, out on the ark, uh, fetched up in Armenia, as we know, and from Armenia, and they were giants. So maybe that answers your previous question. Right, um, yeah. Yes, Ron 
damn, I've forgotten his name. Ron Wyatt is very, very good at this. And he's another one who's been completely blacklisted by mainstream academia because uh, um, he goes off into all sorts of interesting areas that you and I would find fascinating and well worth um, a study, but because it doesn't fit the, you know, the narrative, um, he's been he's been completely washed out of it. Um, but he uh, he found the ark. Oh, I don't know if you saw my two videos, my two Noah videos. Um, I go into it in detail, but Morgan, right. to, to, to cut a long story, another long story short, Morgan says that Noah left from this country. So the two migrations coming back a thousand years and two thousand years after that were simply homecomings. So that could explain why they sound as if they were bloodless migrations then. And, yes, and common yes, language as well, maybe. Yes. Um, the language, oh boy. No, wait a moment. I have to show you another book, if that's all right. Um, this, and I have to thank um, Sean Perry for putting me onto this because it revolutionized my understanding of the Albine section. And it's this, Lawrence Waddle, yeah. the, the British editor. And, um, he shows how um, we are connected back. I know I could just remember what I was going to say, um, how we're connected back um, to the uh, Noah, um, the Noah migration, well, sort of forced migration that was, wasn't it? Um, no, uh, there is a, a script. And again, I won't give away too much, but I did blurt it out on the on the live chat a week or so ago. So I feel I can I can say it again. Um, his dates are approximately 3500 BC. So 2000 years before Albion. That's this, the, the, the hero of this story. And um, of this epic, which is another British epic alongside the Iliad. Um, good stuff this. Um, he is, is said to have come from the Danube Valley and there is a script found in the da Danube Valley called the Vincia script, V-I-N-C with a wee thingy on it, Vincia script. And there's a tiny little um, illustration of what Vincia script looks like. And I thought that looks like Coilbren. So I got out um, my Kyle Bren alphabet from Wilson and Blackett, and I translated the word on the engraving, and that's from five, three, five, five and a half thousand years ago. Wow. Yes. Unbelievable. Well, so, amazing, not unbelievable. But it, well, it, I, it, it, yeah, I'm doing this stuff, and I find it hard to believe. Yeah, I um, so basically, what Wilson and Blackett say about the, uh, the alphabet trail is... Um, the, Dan the, the, the Goths from the Danube Valley bringing their script, who are actually us from, um, from the pre, um, from the Noah thingy, uh, that's the technical term you understand, and they, they, they are known to have gone to Sumer, and they bring this script back with them to Britain, where we call it Colbren. So it's wow. thousands of years old. Wow. Unbelievable. Well, it's not unbelievable. I keep using that expression. No, no, yeah, I agree because, with you. Because it takes my mind. Yeah, uh, in amazing. The too. Amazing. Absolutely. But somebody who's uh, um, somebody like, oh, if I mention poor John Griffith um, and, and his son Adam, they've done such fantastic words at uh, work on the uh, Colbren. Um, it needs people with their sort of open minded uh, um, outlook and their expertise in Kyle Bren to take this tiny little snippet that I found and do some real uh, some real work on it. Uh, that, uh, that's not for me. I can't do that. But somebody like uh, John Griffith certainly could um, if he's not too busy doing other things. And John, if you watch this, I apologize if I've dropped you in it. <laughs> I find it amazing that there's so many people with that intellect to be able to do this because Wilson and Blackett like you I read Holy Kingdom and other books and when you start reading how they deciphered coins yes. and stones I mean it's just yes. mind-blowing and then the hieroglyphs oh. so uh. presumably then there's, there's further evidence for Albine, Brutus, Noah and it's there to be found have you found any? 
I have to say, archaeography is an armchair discipline. Um, we've had a very busy year. Last year was very busy. We moved house and uh, all sorts of things happened. Haven't yet been able to do half the field work that I would like to do. Um, the answer to that has to be, um, at the moment, no. It's not because it's not there. Just but again, this it. is something... It's just I simply haven't been able to find it because I've been laying the groundwork. I want other people who who do the field work, maybe an archaeologist, geologist. We need a geologist to talk uh, to go and find evidence of the comet. This country has been so badly neglected um, in terms of its true history. Uh, I'm, I've just finished writing a section. Where was Albine buried? And the answer to that is I haven't a clue. <laughs> um, what about Brutus? Think, Do you know where Brutus was buried? <laughs> uh, probably uh, um, on the, the, the the ancient records say the British records say he was buried under the white the white tower, the Bryn Gwyn in London, um, and of course the, the 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 Tower of London is um, oh is it oh gosh when were Bolinus and Brennius? Um, four hundred three four hundred BC. The Tower of London is at least a thousand years older um, than than we have been led to believe. I don't mean in its present construction, although there might be some really ancient foundations there. But the Bryn Gwyn was a holy mound. Um, e. O. Gordon goes into this in 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 um, her book Prehistoric London. Um, so it was holy to the Lygrians for thousands of years before, or at least a thousand years before, uh, William the Norman came here and built his tower on it. Uh, that's where Brutus is said to be buried. Well, and you've got no idea where an Albine could have been buried. No, whatever. No, at all. No, whatever. It's odds on she will have been buried somewhere in Norfolk where part of the fleet arrived. Right. Well, uh, for now, I say that I'm going to retract that speedily. She, uh, the the part of her fleet um, went into the Severn, part of it went into the Thames, part of it went into the Humber, right. and she landed all round the south. Yeah. Um, what about uh, Brutus's return? Where did they land? Torbay. Torbay. Oh, yes. Right. I know at this at this point I just want to put my head in my hands and uh, go and take up gardening or something. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So uh, then, all the records point to it. Yeah. So where where did they spread then? From the south up, from all sides in. Um, yeah, as is the way you carry on, uh, uh, as, as is the way of migrants. You you keep your objective in mind. But when you're on an island, of course, uh, your your barriers are oh, the coast. coastlines. Yeah. So you carry on and you you go and explore and um, you find your way round until you fall off a cliff basically. Um, so I, I think it will it will definitely have been from the south and from the south east and southwest upwards and outwards, yes. There are places all over Scotland with um, Sumerian connections. Um, gosh, I mean, I won't go into, won't go into that. that, that one. <laughs> I think that's another migration, <laughs> isn't it? The I think it probably, it's, it's, it's certainly another story, yes. Yeah. But um, yes. You previously mentioned you write extensively in novels as well. Now, yes. I think I think it's you can put your head in all these technical books and then your head spins. And I love a novel to just a bit of light reading, bit of relief, especially on yes. a hot summer's light day up in the garden. Yes. So have you read any, um, sorry, have you written any novels? I have. Um, I've got, one was published, actually, the box of books arrived when we were at Tonteg. Oh. And I'm so nervous of seeing my own work in print for the first time that I circled round the box for about three days <laughs> before I could bring myself to open it and have a look. But yes, this one, this is my first one and so far my only one out. Um, and I'm sure people will have seen uh, the, the cover. This Ross very kindly publicised it for me. Um, it's available through Matador Publications and it does have the Iliad as um, its basis. I use forgotten, neglected and hidden British history is the basis for all my novels. Um, I got several more which could come out 
t uh, tomorrow, but um, no, I was no plans to publish them right away. Then I'd love to if 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 I could find the right publisher. I thought yeah. that might be me, but I'm not sure that I can manage to write and publish as well. So I've done a bit of a backtrack on that. But if I found a sympathetic publisher who who would allow me to keep my own standards of English and punctuation. Um, and not expect me to use alternate when I mean alternative and that sort of thing. Americanisms and all that. Yeah, yeah. grim, grim. Um, yeah. Then, uh, then I'd love to sign a contract. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Marshall. I really appreciate the time you've given us today, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. In it's your work, pleasure. yeah, and and with academia, and with book sales as well. Well, thank and you so, so much for interest. So on the end of this uh, recording, we'll um, show where uh, we can buy the books, the first one that's already in print, and also then the Great Migrations. That's going to be an important one. Yeah, I so, think so. Um, you've mentioned you've already recorded interviews on your own YouTube channel. What's that called? Oh, my own YouTube channel is just my own, it's just March Labrahams, but um, I did quite a few with Ross, which are yeah. on the... Britain's the ones with Ross will all be re left on yes. Britain's in History yes, YouTube right. yes, channel. Excellent. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, so, so we look forward to seeing more from you in the future then. Well, I've got another one coming up actually tomorrow uh, with, a, with another YouTuber. Um, and isn't it nice, by the way, to see Ross's subscribers going up all the time? It's fantastic he'd be so pleased uh, yes i've got another interview coming up tomorrow and i've just i can can i give you this as a a, um, a nice little thing to end with because it's a real um uh philip to me i i amazing um i've been invited to collaborate on a children's book um by the illustrator david press david william press he's called and um, he's seen my work and he would like me to contribute to, to giving him um, uh, um, the historical background. Now, his book, and I promised I promised I would get this right, the Bulldog Bikers, um, What Made Britain Great? And I should be able, I should be clever enough to show you the, uh, the, the cover, which he so thoughtfully sent me. Sorry, David, if you're watching this, I'm not very good at this sort of thing. Um, but yes, I've been invited to collaborate with him. So this is a, it, 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 all points west. It's fantastic. I'm so lucky. Excellent. We're lucky to have you uh, in the movement with us. Thank well, you very much. Pleasure. Great pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Thank you. Welcome. I know we'd all like to thank Marshall for her work on the GoFundMe campaign and uh, with the video content on our hidden history. And we will all wish her the best for, of success for this new book. So Marshall also has a YouTube channel with many videos on historical matters to watch, which was mentioned then at the end of uh, that particular video we played. So let's take a little look at some of the uh, live chat. Uh, uh, I had Margaret um, sitting opposite earlier, which is why we thought there was an error on the um, audio, but it's because I've got two desktop audios open. I don't know which one I should close down. So if there's a feedback right now, it's because there's two open. Apologies for that. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to iron that one out if I'm ever invited back. Uh, George Bodley was uh, he was glad to hear that Ross's work will continue. Well, that's uh, mainly because of Angie and the boys who've kept the channel going with the reverence. So all the thanks is to them. And then also to people like Marshall, uh, without uh, all this intelligent technical um, speak about the history, uh, there would be no furtherance of it. But there's quite a lot of people out there who've got in very deep knowledge and um, myself and Margaret, we were astounded in the middle of that broadcast how deep uh, this subject is. Uh, Monique Escobar uh, was uh, talking a lot there about uh, the Brutus lineage back to Aeneas. It started to get very deep at that point between Monique and uh, Marshall. I'm glad you, you can both understand it, ladies. 
Uh, Illuminati picked up on the part above the Norman inch. That was interesting. And I think Patrick said something about the Sumerians be, being Goths as part of uh, Waddle's claims. And then Marshall then brought up the book about or written by Waddle uh, later in the interview. That was very interesting. George Bodley, he was very glad that um, this work is being repeated. And he said, um, you've got to question everything of importance. And that actually made uh, George a very free thinker. So Brad Kemple pointed out the need to question even Wilson and Blackett's work and not to regard them as being sacrosanct in, in everything. And we all um, do question some of the things, but not much of it. Um, I know Marshall questioned and found uh, the answers that she was getting to be highly illuminatory. Um, we've got to give our thanks back to Sospan Bach, who thanked us, and uh, especially the best wishes to Angie and the boys. Uh, K, K. Higgs liked Marshall's hustle. <laughs> and quite frankly, we're unashamedly advertising Marshall's new book because it's going to add a great deal of weight to the um, the facts and the knowledge that is out there about this very ancient hidden British history. And Andrew Whelans thanks Marshall and he basically thanks Marshall on behalf of all of us for making this Sunday. Well, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and I hope that you enjoyed our time together and the chance to chat live. Um, thank you very much to Angela and the boys who, after much trial and error, got me technically up to speed with the software. <laughs> well, actually tonight proved that wasn't quite totally up to speed, uh, especially understanding how my laptop is so sensitive that I can't lean on it. And uh, I didn't watch the battery life either. We had a very close call with the battery running out which uh, thankfully um, we're unaware of. Well, I'm aware of it, obviously. Uh, thanks to David then for his be behind the scenes work. He's behind the scenes monitoring the chat. And uh, hopefully it's all gone very well. Um, thank you very much for attending. And we've got another technical issue now because Ross always uh, ended with music. We're going to have Arnie playing uh, on the violin at some stage, but it's got to be a pre-recorded video which he'll send us. So Ross used to keep the chat open for longer. Maybe he did, did that uh, just by um, playing a video of, of the music. Heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. But you don't really care for music, do ya? Well, it goes like this the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, the powerful king composed.
doesn't end does it <laughs> the, uh, the amount of errors they just keep coming <laughs> well uh, the, traditionally we ended with music and we will be having Arnie uh, w with his violin at some point and he, he can do the videos for us uh, so that um, YouTube uh, song there was a, a, a local lady uh, Natalie Eleanor local to our Rhonda Cannon Taft, that is. And uh, she's given me permission to use her music videos. So no c copyright infringement. Uh, you can check out her other songs on YouTube, Natalie Eleanor. So hopefully that went as well as it could. The programme that is uh, attributed to number 126 will be edited. And I'll edit out a lot of my mistakes. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining this evening on behalf of Angie and the boys, Marshall, and all of us at Britain's Hidden History. Thank you very much for your attendance. <laughs>